Welcome to the Natural History Cupboard. Come on in. And welcome back to the best natural history podcast out there, the Natural History Cupboard, the place where the weird and wonderful parts of the natural world come together. Today, I am your host, Aaron, and with me, as always, is Gareth, who is not in Hello. with me. Uh, Gareth, how are you not doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I'm not great, people. Um, as you can probably see, we're not in the same room, and that's for a very good reason. I've been off very ill with COVID for the last couple of days, and I'm actually at a point where I can talk just about um so yeah to save aaron from me contaminating him and contaminating the cupboard <laughs> we've gone virtual this week um so yeah it basically means that i can sit here in my living room um and uh and aaron can sit there in the cupboard um and i don't you know give him some sort of horrible lurgy which means that he'll have uh just as bad a week as you did a couple of weeks ago in fact aaron you you've had your you know your your time of uh, being ill where you yes. with your I've leg. Had an, I've had enough time off. Thank you very much. I've uh, yeah. I'm now fully fully mobile. Um, and able I have to not been my leg. <laughs> I have struggled to go upstairs. This has been fun. So, On the subject uh, yeah. of, of uh, you not being in the podcast, I I am already noticing that I keep flicking my eyes down to where I can actually see Gareth. So if I do that throughout this podcast, I do apologise. It's because I'm trying to pay attention to you guys at home listening He's and watching on us. The floor. But I keep looking at Gareth, who is on a screen down there. Um, oh, so yeah, there's a little bit of inside baseball behind the curtain there. Um, well, have you been up to anything before you got ill? Uh, drinking an awful lot to make sure that you know I've got enough fluids on board. Um, let's see. It's <laughs> not uh, where that sounded like it was going. I thought you were talking about an awful lot of alcohol, mate. I do you know what I'd I would I would say that that would help, but I've lost my sense of taste. This is currently a pint of cherry coke, although you wouldn't know. It may as well just be brown water at the moment because <laughs> I can't taste the cherry in it. Um, oh, it did the worst thing was realizing that that, that I, I had. I mean, I, most people have had COVID at some point within the last couple of years, obviously. But this is the first time that I've ever lost my sense of taste with it. With the first time around, didn't lose my sense of taste. This no. time, I went, oh, oh, well, this doesn't taste of anything. And, um, oh, well, <laughs> just... Just continue with some. It makes food very interesting when you can't taste. I was going to say, anyway, it's, I've, it's purely I've, down to your visuals. I've not experienced that. The one time where I definitely had COVID, I was, or at least my family had COVID, so we just assumed I had COVID too because I was with them the entire yeah. time. Uh, in fact, I was isolated in a room with them the entire time. Uh, yeah. I was asymptomatic. Uh, the only thing I felt. Uh -huh. was I, I I didn't feel even tired, but one weird symptom I did seem to have was that I didn't feel within myself like I could do, like I can move a chair. I didn't, I, obviously when I pulled the chair, it was fine, but like I didn't feel like I could mentally pull it. it was, that was a bit weird. Yeah. But I I was asymptomatic and food tasted like food tasted. I have to say that's one of the weirdest um symptoms odd sensation like, i can't imagine like eating things and not being able to taste them that's that's really weird yeah yeah it's very odd um it's made me want to try some sort of you know like food experiments but uh oh yeah at the same time i've not had the energy to do anything like that yeah. so like... my week has consisted of very little um apart from staying up and watching tv because i can't sleep so yeah, uh, I've caught up on a lot of TV, um, and that's about it, really. Oh, today I have done one or two minor things. I've started three D printing again, hmm. but because uh, I I stripped down the three D printer and and cleaned it and rebuilt it. So what are you printing I found myself this time? I am currently three D printing a 
scaled up Lego parrot. Ah, uh, yeah, we were talking because about because why yeah. not? Um, this week I've not done much because obviously I'm pretty much just over the weekend or towards the end of the working week. Really, uh, was when I started to feel more mobile. Um, certainly there was still a little bit of a of an ache uh, going on. But uh, now... It's just become the podcast where we complain about our illnesses now, isn't it? <laughs> We're getting old. Uh, despite having a bit of swelling still, uh, I feel no pain, no discomfort, no awkwardness now. So I am fully mobile. I've managed to see within the span of 24 hours um, a moth I've never seen before and a butterfly I've never seen before. Uh, I don't know the names of the species. I'm going to have to uh, find out. The moth I got a photo of and I will uh, display that here now um and hopefully you'll have displayed the name as well yeah i'll label it uh but the butterfly didn't get a photo of but it was stunning uh i think it, i think i have a new favorite moth species and a new favorite butterfly species without even knowing their names yet so right well um well despite the fact that we you know we're both uh both injured and old and decrepit and just haven't got long for this world should we um move into the news Age is just an attitude, Gareth. Age is just an attitude. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's go. Cool. It's the news! Right, well, we're into this week's news. Aaron, take it away. Well, every week, the weird and wonderful world of natural history offers up an embarrassment of riches when it comes to stories and interesting uh, news. And though we here at the Natural History Cupboard are a small team, uh, and it feels a lot smaller today, even though you are with me remotely, uh, it is our aim to... Spirit. <laughs> well, we want to keep you guys up to date with the weird, uh, wonderful, good, odd and exciting that is going on out there. So let's open up the Natural History Cupboard newsreel and dive on into some of the more interesting headlines. And so I believe is... Gareth, it's your turn first today. Yes. To start things off uh, from BBC News, um, Zoo hails birth of one of the world's rarest animals. Um, to most people, though, this is just going to look like a baby donkey, uh, but it is very much not. A leggy um, youngster of an onager, which is a species of equid, uh, from uh, the Middle East, um, which mm. are uh, basically the forerunners to domestic donkeys. These are exceedingly rare animals. There are at least, sorry, there are less than 600 surviving wild onagers, uh, but the birth of this one uh, hopefully helps to bolster their numbers in uh, in one of the, the UK's best zoos. Very good. Um and again from BBC, uh, extinct butterfly now breeding in Kent. Mm. Uh, the large tortoiseshell butterfly was thought to have died out in England uh, roughly 60 years ago. An unconfirmed hypothesis points the finger of blame at Dutch elm disease. But in exciting news, more than 30 were spotted around Woodland in Kent this year, which is not just a good sign for the species itself, but also a good sign for the health of the local ecosystem too, especially if this population should continue to grow. Did it say where that population is? Kent, said. Yeah, yeah, but where in Kent? Oh, it, um, it don't believe it's named. But I would, I would speculate that there's the possibility it could be the same areas of woodland that they've been uh, reintroducing bison because, well, we talked about how that had changed the environment in those areas quite a bit. So my next story... Um, well, I've still got some breath in me. It's from New Scientist, and it's RoboTuna reveals how foldable fins help speedy fish maneuver. A robotic tuna mimic uh, has been uh, used to basically show how the fins on actual live tuna uh, work. This particular one has clever fin folding mechanisms uh, that are similar to how real tuna uh, move which help increase this robot's turning speed by about three uh, by about 33%. So it allows these uh, robotic tuna, which it's a, it's a very odd looking little robot, but um, quite cool. 
Uh, it would be what I would want if I had a robotic fish tank, I suppose. Um, it basically allows uh, scientists to work out uh, the sort of speed and maneuverability that tuna have. Hmm. That's cool. Um, before I get into my next article, I just want to jump back to my last article. The butterflies were spotted in Bleen Woods, which is indeed where the Wyson are. Um, so, you know, yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, so next is uh, from Monga Bay. And that uh, headline is a tribe once declared extinct helps reintroduce salmon to the Columbia River. So Kettle Falls had been important um, salmon fishing waters for the heavily oppressed peoples of the Sinex tribe, uh, it's a, which was a culture wrongly declared extinct in Canada in 1956. Uh, spoilers, they were declared extinct so that they could, so that the government could uh, exploit the, the rivers for a damming project. Anyway, Kettle Falls was subject to extensive dam construction through the early part of the 20th century blocking the salmon from completing their routes to historic spawning grounds but now a coalition of tribes including the Sinex, uh have signed a 200 million agreement with the u.s government to reintroduce salmon to the rivers above the dams it is hoped that these salmon will repopulate what was once one of the most significant salmon fishing grounds of the pacific northwest and be the first step in writing the historical wrong when the Sinex were declared extinct like i said in order to eliminate their claim to the North Columbia River, a river previously known as Schwan et Qua by this next people. I'd love to be there for that conversation. So, yeah, I know we declared you technically extinct and all, but we're cool, right? Yeah, we cool. Well, OK, the, this agreement is with the US government, whereas they were declared extinct by the Canadian government. Oh, it was a the lot Canadian more a lot more apologetic than I suppose from the yeah, Canadian government. More apologies, yeah. <laughs> anyway, how many countries can Gareth annoy this week? Um, so my my uh, my final short one for you um, is from Bird Guides again. Uh, I really like using this site now. Uh, Hoopy establish <laughs> a Dutch breeding population. Uh, Hoopy are a fantastic bird uh, found throughout mainly southern Europe and into Africa. Uh, but they do mm. come up towards us in the north here every now and again. Uh, and the uh, this species has had sporadic breeding in uh, the Netherlands for the first half of the 20th century. However, been between 1990 and 2020, only two pairs were known to have bred. In the four years since then, a handful of pairs have nested in the country, according to the Sovan Dutch Center for Field uh, Ornithology. Um, and it's since 1990, uh, these two pairs, uh, they they were sure that they had bred, uh, but Hoopy are gaining a foothold again uh, in the country in the last four years and uh, could basically, well, they, they basically have five pairs uh, breeding there in, in uh, the Netherlands at the moment. So that's, that's quite a cool bird to go and see if you are uh, in the Netherlands. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and my final... Uh, article from the newsreel comes again uh, from the BBC and the headline is Wallaby sighted in Nottinghamshire village so wallabies are obviously more commonly associated with Australia and New Guinea uh, and they are not often what you'd expect to see whilst out in the British Isles but that's exactly what one driver spotted whilst out and about Ben Thompson not only saw the animal but photographed it as as it watched him approach there are colonies or at least isolated feral mobs of various wallaby species found uh, throughout the UK, uh, released intentionally or quite by accident. But I particularly like this story because it's a non-native species uh, that is fast on its feet. Gareth might know where I'm about to go with this. Yeah. Uh, being snapped on a camera very, very clearly. Uh, once again, thrown into doubt whether there are in fact really leopards and cougars in the British countryside. Yeah. If there are, then would-be spotters now really need to up their camera game. Yeah, there. I can. I mean, you both, you and I, have had to recapture wallabies that have done escapey yep. bits. So uh, yeah, they are an animal that I would say are probably more numerous in the British countryside than any big cat. Yeah, I've never seen one alive. However, was driving, I 
thought I might have seen one uh, uh, expired, shall we say. Yeah, yeah they don't. Road unfortunately, they don't tend to do too well with our weather, which is odd. Um, you'd think for an animal that can cope with an awful lot of things, but, uh, well, it's it's nowhere near as humid as the parts of Australia. You know, sorry, it's it's far too humid uh, here for a lot of them, and, and they can end up with a lot of uh, respiratory infections. I wonder what that's like. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that will just about wrap it up for this week's installment of the Natural History Cupboard Newsreel. Remember, if you guys at home have articles or topics of interest that you think that we should cover in our news segment send them on in you can use any of the normal ways of getting in contact with us or send a message via the pouch of a feral uh wallaby out in the british countryside uh, and you might just see uh your chosen topic or news article covered here in the newsreel or if it's uh, good, uh interesting enough for us to discuss in further detail perhaps in the main topic and Gareth has our main topic today. Gareth, take it away. Yeah, we'll see how long I can survive through this one. But it's also of interest <laughs> to you, Aaron. As oh, yeah? the uh, as the summer sort of rolls on a bit, um, we're getting into that classic time of the year where your favourite insect turns up. What's yeah, your the, favourite yeah. insect, Aaron? The barbecue Nazi, also known as a wasp. Now, now, let's not <laughs> let's not paint them in a bad light. For the simple- no, I I actually have grown to to actually really uh, like wasps now. I'm still a little bit nervous of them, but yeah. it's a start. Well, how many have you seen so far this year? Do you know what I've 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 actually noticed that I've not seen that many. Really? Uh, does that does that kind of play play with into what where I'm going with this? Yes, it does. Yeah. Thank you very much, Aaron. Um, in fact, the main article comes from the BBC News again, uh, and it's simply titled, Where Have All the Wasps Gone? Um, Now, this is an article that has been basically, uh, I'd say heavily influenced by a pest um, control company. So they're obviously going out and dealing with wasps nests in people's houses or sheds or things like that. In a way, they're perfectly positioned to be able to sort of get a count on wasp numbers. But at the same time, they're also going to have a slightly biased view, I suppose, of wasps as the animals that they are. But essentially, the article uh, goes into um, the fact that uh, it does actually start off, which I think is brilliant. Despite their bad reputation and tendency to disrupt picnics, wasps are important parts of our ecosystem. I would like to make that very clear. Wasps are basically mm. pest control agents. They do a massive amount of uh, pest control. The first half of the summer uh, is where they're building up their nests and they'll be munching down on caterpillars, all sorts of different insects, and stuffing themselves with as much protein as possible. Towards the very end of the summer is when you tend to find them turning up at picnics because they're looking for sort of sugary foods. So say, think yeah. your sandwiches, your cakes, your drinks, whatever. Um, which is when they tend to come into contact with humans a bit more. But this time of the year, there should be far more of them flying around. Unfortunately, uh, there seems to be a lack of them uh, this year. Colder and wetter weather in the UK uh, and climate change globally has impacted uh, on these invertebrates quite a bit. Um, The change has been monitored by garden experts and pest controllers. um, But, uh, well, where have all the wasps gone and will they return? So the numbers are so low, it's unbelievable, said a razor pest owner, James Tennant, uh, who was called out to treat between 60 and 80 wasps' nests this time last year. In comparison, his company, uh, which covers Essex, Suffolk and Cambridgeshire, uh, has called out to deal with only eight nests during June of this year and the 10th of July. So that's a really low number. Mm. Um, And it's... Yeah, it does seem to be down to an awful lot of um, factors. We've had a rubbish year for butterflies, um, which means rubbish year for caterpillars and a rubbish year for everything that eats caterpillars and a knock-on effect on all of that. We've had, uh, Aaron, I think you'll you'll probably be able to agree, uh, we've had probably a week of some really hot weather within this last week or so. Um, Yeah but it's now cooling back down again. 
so again. yeah it's it's almost like summer was there and gone now that's standard for uk summer but our weather is becoming far and more peaks and troughs and and all sorts of um bizarre combinations because of climate change and that's impacting uh whole food chains and and the animals that basically eat them or you know mm. that that sit at the top of the food chain like wasps now wasps are obviously prey for an awful lot of other animals birds reptiles mammals you may not think of it but they get eaten by an awful lot of things um it doesn't massively impact their numbers because they live in a big colony and that's kind of why those animals live in a colony is strength in numbers but they themselves are the top of the sort of insect um food chain in your garden really and they're flying around they're eating all of those things that would basically be below them but without that food chain there the apex predators disappear and um that's yeah it's basically what we're seeing at the moment a loss of wasps will impact on the uh, in on us in a number of ways can lead to reduced pollination because they do actually pollinate things as well to a, a, a an extent yeah. Without wasps, plants are more likely to be eaten by insect larvae, otherwise controlled by wasps. So uh, we could see a knock-on effect in uh, this next year if more animals have survived through being predated uh, that are pests that would normally be controlled at this time of the year, more of them breed. So by next this time next year, there's more of a pest species. It can also lead to uh, a decline in uh, native species of plants as well because they can also be affected by um, some of these these pest species so we could see a real knock-on effect in the whole ecosystem around us and it, it basically highlights the importance of of insects without them we are dead that's it mm. game over you know we need them for pollinating our food we need them for controlling pests i can guarantee sorry I can guarantee you there will be some people who will have read that article and gone, why, brilliant, oh, no more wasps, I hate wasps, just like the same sort of people that would be like, way, I hate seagulls, you know, let's get rid of seagulls. But they all play an important part. Without those individual bricks in the wall, the whole thing comes down. So, yeah, yeah. another reason why, yes, you may find them irritating, but they are there for a much better reason in a lot of cases than we are so yeah yeah i i think i can count on one hand the number of times i've seen a wasp this year which considering we're now we're recording on the 5th of august mm -hmm. um that's quite that, that's quite shocking really yeah um yeah, and yeah. speaking of someone who has spent most of his life terrified of wasps and has now come to i mean i joke of course because because it's quite well known amongst my friends and colleagues or former colleagues uh that i am hilariously frightened of these tiny little bugs yet i will spend hours in an enclosure with nile crocodiles or uh ammo tigers or uh, well, other buzzing around your face much more dangerous animals i'm quite happy to sit like Obviously, with a fence, but I'm quite happy. I'm quite confident around these dangerous That's animals. Brilliant. Yeah. And then a wasp sends me packing. Um. Obviously, I'm not that way anymore. I'm I'm much more calm and mellow around them. Uh, arguably because of the wasp creature feature we did. I mean, I was already on the kind of calming down trend, but our creature feature where I learned a lot about them. Um. Actually it uh it kind of pushed me even further so i have come to a a respect uh for them and uh i suppose a, an admiration for them um Ooh. and i like i actually like watching them go about their business now so long as they do, i tend to freak if they get too close without me noticing if that makes don't, sense don't get me wrong they can be annoying no they if they, right if they face, face you know if but, I'm watching yeah. them and they kind of going across flowers or across something and I'm watching them, I can stay pretty calm. But it's when they appear, 
that sends me straight back to where I was before. I will say though, Gareth, and I'm I'm not sure if this is related or just coincidence. The the wasps I have seen this year, the the few that I have seen, far more um uh keen to invade my personal space than normal. Yeah. Um usually my yeah, usually I don't find that I mean they do buzz in your face and stuff and especially if you're doing something that's upsetting them that you don't realize is upsetting them or don't intend to upset them. But no, I've, I have just been walking um, and I've noticed that they, they've been far more keen to, to come at me. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, yeah, let's, let's hope this is a trend that um, doesn't keep up and uh, yeah, hopefully, the, hopefully there'll be wasps year. back bothering you. Uh, this same time next year in in decent numbers. So let's mm. let's move into our creature feature, shall we? Yeah. It's the creature feature. Right. Well, we're into this week's creature feature. Let's see how I long I I last from where <laughs> I am. Uh, Aaron, take it away. Yeah. Good luck. Um. So this week we're going back to my kind of corner of comfort. Really, we're going to have a look at another big cat. Um. <laughs> And to, it, it, it's another exceptional member of the felid uh, uh, branch of car carnivora, um, as most of them are, to be honest. Uh, the pinnacle of carnivores, I would say, uh, is the cats. But uh, the jaguar is a uh, it's another animal that I've probably said this about tigers when I did the tigers and the snow leopard um, creature feature that they. They're as beautiful as they are deadly. Um, I think mm. that's a really good way to uh, kind of sum them up. Now, before we get into the cat like properly, I just wanted to point out how cool the animal's name is. Um, so in British, the word is actually pronounced jaguar uh, with three syllables. No, 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 Aaron. You've got to do it properly. If you're going to do it in English, English, you've got to do it as a jaguar. Jaguar. Jaguar, you've got to go as posh as you possibly can. Warm up the jaguar, Smithers. One Going does not go up. One does not simply walk to the shops. One gets in Juan's jaguar. <laughs> quite, quite so. Uh, yeah. So, okay, then we'll try. We'll try it differently, uh, and then I'll try and do it in another accent in a minute and offend <laughs> even so, so in English, in British English, we say jaguar, jaguar. jaguar. Uh, however, it, so there's or you could just, sorry, uh, go on. Or you could just say it as a jag, a jag. Yeah, you can say jag. But in America, they only use two symbols, and they pronounce it jaguar. Um, now, considering the modern jag jaguar is from the Americas, uh. I tend to lean towards their pronunciation of it, but admittedly, haven't been raised. No, Aaron. I, I do, was just. Yeah. Uh, I sounds so much better. I I think that wherever possible, because for me, I would say that pronouncing jaguar jaguar is akin to calling a jalapeno a jalapeno. Um, yeah, Japalinos. <laughs> It's uh, you know, it's 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 theirs, so I I kind of fall in line with 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 what they say. That being said, I don't I don't really care. Um, and I will, and you'll probably hear me do it throughout this creature feature. I will use them in, in interchangeably. I I really don't care. I was brought up saying jaguar, um, and I've kind of just grown accustomed to saying jaguar. Um, does it does make it come from any difference to me? Does it come from the Tupi language or is it an English word that we have just given to this animal? No, no, it, it does come from the Tupi language. Yeah, well done. Ah, well then I, I will I will yield Jaguar to Jaguar then. Um well actually we're gonna get onto this in a minute, but I think the Tupi word is actually four syllables. Uh but we'll we'll actually get into that. So the word the word as Gareth it's just point out it comes from the Tupi uh Tupi Guarani Tupi Guar I can't even I can't say it now because <laughs> that pronunciation's muddling through my head. 
Uh, so it comes to us through the Tupi Guarani language, Tupi Guarani language. Um, that is, uh, and they pronounce it Yaguara. So, so four syllables for them, and that literally means wild beast that overcomes its prey at a bound. Um, so yeah, yeah. But because this animal and it, it shares that name with so many other species in that region, uh, the Guyanan people have named it slightly differently. Um, they name it Jaguarete, which means true beast. So yeah, a very cool name. And its scientific binomial name is also pretty cool. Uh, it's Panthera Onca, uh, which is ancient Greek and Portuguese, respectively. So Panthera, obviously the ancient Greek form of, of large felid. Um, and Onca, uh, coming from the Portuguese Onsa, uh, which basically means a spotted cat that's larger than a lynx. Um, and we've come across that before with, with the snow leopard, which is yeah. uh, in French was named Ounce. Um, and I think actually it's um, it's original the same name. root word. So, yeah, it's very similar root word there. Yeah. So now, Aaron, let's look at the cat. Aaron does yeah. Jagarundi overlap into that in any way, shape or form? I believe so. It didn't specifically say this when I was looking up um, Jaguars, but I reckon that when I come to doing Jagarundi at some point, it... it um, it most certainly will. Uh, it, it, I, I think it will become evident that they share the same root word. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if it's something like beast or something, you know. Yeah. I mean, maybe like Jagarundi means like minor beast or something. Because, I mean, for anyone maybe. who's unaware of what a Jagarundi is, they're a. They look what. They, they look. Well, the, their other name is uh, the otter cat. They look a bit like what would happen if you kind of smashed an otter and a cat together. But very, very specifically, an otter smashed together with a with a with a cougar. I think. I think there's something yes. very, yeah, yeah. very cougary about them. Uh, they are another very odd as well. Weird looking, yeah. Um, mm. Very cool animal. Definitely deserve another creature feature. Well, you know, now that you've pretty much ticked off all the big cats, you can start moving all the sme uh, smeal smeal cats? smeal cats, smeal cats, small cats. Yeah. Well, small I've cats. seen. Technically, still got leopards to do. True, true. Now let's look at the cat, uh, Gareth. Kind of the same yes. exercise I got you doing with the other two uh, big cat creature features. Uh, mm -hmm. What I want you to do is, can you list the species um, in order of size? Just the five Ooh. big cats. Okay. Start with the largest to the smallest. Well, I'm a leopard. Uh, sorry, I'm a tiger. I was, I was thinking. Uh, yeah. You don't um, you don't have to go into subspecies. Just, just. Okay. Just all right. The five. Well, it's 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 tiger, lion, jaguar, leopard, snow leopard. Yes. Well done. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Quite right. So as you heard there, um, jaguars are the the third uh, in terms of size, third largest. Um, you should be kind of imagining a cat that's larger than a leopard, but quite a bit smaller than a than a than a lion. There's not too much in it, really. Uh, but what He's else? A stocky boy, though. I was gonna say jaguars are stocky, um, stocky, much stockier than any of the other big cats. Uh, that's for sure. It, it's almost uh, like the typical musculature of a big cat has been completely uh, kind of squished onto a much smaller skeletal frame, so they still have all the all the muscles. Uh, they're like just, a hench leopard. They are, yeah, a hench leopard. That's a perfectly good description, really. Um, and in in doing that, they've not lost any power. In fact, in some cases, they've actually uh, increased power by shrinking down a little bit like Ant-Man in the, in Marvel. Um but we'll uh, we'll we won't go down that rabbit hole. Um yeah, to uh Ant -hole, you mean. Sorry. Ant Hill you mean. Ant Hill yeah, that Ant Hill yeah. Uh in terms of dimensions and weight, um actually Jaguars they differ quite a bit. Um 
it, within the, their own species. But and that tends to be between the sexes, uh, but more so between um, regionality. Uh, the latter factor being grounds for past studies to consider there actually being nine subspecies of jaguar. Uh, we now are actually pretty confident that there is only one type of jaguar. Uh, and that means that jaguars are, are monotypic. There's no subspecies of them recognized at the moment, really. Um, now, that could be either confirmed or it could go up in the air again, because there are actually two other types of jaguar that are extinct. But it's unclear where they fall in terms of who they relate to. Uh, so, yeah. In terms of our extant modern jaguar, there's only one type, as opposed to you know, other big cats have other uh, have plenty of other subspecies. Anyway, uh, that range in size that I was talking about uh, across the this species, it depends somewhat on regionality. With the larger uh, specimens being found in the southern reaches of uh, of its Pan American range, and as I said, they are dimorphic between the species between the sexes. Sorry. Uh, but generally, you are, as I say, imagining a stocky big cat between the sizes of uh, a leopard and a lion uh, that measures in a, up to 81 centimetres tall, 2.6 metres long from tip of the nose to tip of the tail, and weighing in uh, at the very most, this is for a big, big male, at about 158 kilograms, usually uh, much less. 158? Yeah. Wow, that's yeah, that's impressive. That's that's for a big male, a big big male. Okay, uh, thinking about, I, I believe, uh, females are twenty percent smaller than males, so a female is not going to reach anywhere near that size. But hmm. uh, yeah, a big male can. I think that to be fair, I say a big male can. That's the largest. That's the largest specimen, uh, ever found, ever documented. It was a 158 kilogram male. Um, they, despite having such such weight, as I say, they are uh, a squat, stocky, compressed, um, big cat. Uh, and they they have actually got the shortest legs and shortest tail length of all the big cats in proportionate to that body mass. So at a glance, the jaguar's coat could be confused with that of their close uh, cousin, the leopard, or their slightly more distant cousin, the cheetah. Uh, however, upon a better good look, uh, you'll find it pretty easy to spot the difference. So they're, whilst whilst cheetahs are uh, quite nice small spots and the leopard has rosettes, what the jaguar has is actually a pattern in of very deep black spots. Uh, now on the head, these spots are pretty solid but on their flanks they actually kind of blotch and merge to become these what we, what we would call rosettes um now these take on a, a bit of a squarish shape and they're similar to le leopard rosettes but usually much larger and also you can find other spots actually in and around the rosettes which you don't tend to with leopards uh spots along the spine also merge they kind of merge along down uh down the spine forming almost like a stripe um down the length of its body and the spots merge yet again on the tail this time forming bands around the tail and then ending the tail in a nice kind of black uh, uh tip now these spots contrast usually against uh, a mostly yellowish tan um base color with a white underbelly and we'll come on to uh onto uh, why I say usually there in a moment. And what's the use of these spots and rosettes? What, why is the coat, what advantage does that give the coat? Well, obviously that's camouflage. Whilst these cats are known to frequent hotter, drier, more arid environments, particularly when you get into their, the, the part of their range that kind of overlaps into the United States, the Southern United States, their preferred habitat is obviously dense, dark jungle dry deciduous forests moist broadleaf forests uh found in tropical and subtropical climes rainforests and cloud forests all feature in their range and are all areas in which disruptive patterning such as the rosetted coat of uh, of a jaguar uh would help these cats vanish into the undergrowth 
The jaguar also favors riparian habitats, so anywhere with with rivers and swamps, with plentiful and dense foliage, uh, which they can hide in and traverse through. Now here they are active mostly at twilight, when the dappled light of the day's kind of dying sunlight is causing the floor itself to appear kind of rosetted in in a sense. And when this happens on the forest floor, it it pretty much renders our our feared friends completely invisible. Um, however, they are also active at night, a time that presents more opportunities for a cat with a particularly useful mutation. And that mutation is melanism. The jaguar is one of few cats that naturally displays a different color morph in the wild. Uh, and these aren't a different subspecies or a different species. As I say, there is only one jaguar. Uh, they are still very much Panthera onca jaguars, but it's a different coat color, a different phase, morph, whatever you like, want to call it. it it's a, just a posh word for mutation. It's a mutant, uh, but a naturally occurring one. About 10% of all jaguars are melanistic, but as of 2020, we actually know that 25%, that's quarter of the entire population, of Costa Rican jaguars uh, show this coat mutation. The fact that this is more than twice the global average shows us that the mutation is actually advantageous, obviously due to camouflage, uh, and thus has been selected for by jaguars uh, looking to mate. Now, that seems somewhat like the, I'm guessing you're probably about to say this, but that seems somewhat like Indonesian leopards. It does. Yeah, I wasn't about to say that because I'm kind of saving that for the leopard thing. But every... Is it, is it Indonesian ones or was it Malaysian ones? It's Sorry, the Malaysian remember. ones. So every, mm. every leopard south of the Thai-Malaysia border, they're all melanistic. Mm. I can't even think of how long that it's been since they've seen a rosetted leopard in Malaysia. And again, Malaysia, it, I mean, the Tam and the Gara, just, for, just to throw one example out, the Tam and the Gara uh, in Malaysia is the oldest rainforest on earth. And having been there, I can tell you it's incredibly dense and dark and and beautiful in, in every way. Yeah. It doesn't take much to block out light once you get below a certain level of the canopy. No, the canopy so, is thick yeah. enough. And then you've got all the under under canopy and um, the uh, and the underbrush itself to, to contend with. A cat that in the darkness, no one hears you scream as the <laughs> jaguar or leopard takes you. Yeah. Um, there is a difference between melanism in jaguars and melanism in leopards. Um, but I think I'll talk about that with the leopards. In the jaguar's case, the melanistic coat is due to a single dominant gene uh, being expressed. And it presents as black at first glance. But in direct sunlight, you can actually see that the coat is just incredibly dark brown. Um, very near black, really, but it is just incredibly dark brown. When direct sunlight hits it, you can still see the rosettes on them. You still see those markings, and that's because those markings are true black uh, pigment. So, yeah, um, it's not quite a black leopard, a black jaguar. It's a sorry. bit like a glossy starling, actually, I suppose, in, in some yeah. coat. Yeah, uh, that... shine to an extent because they they look almost black or purple mm. when you get up close to them and see the same sort of thing their feathers do look almost brown in yeah the white that's light. right I, and actually, I mean that's two very different things but at, at this similar point, at this point in the in this creature feature is probably um a good opportunity to shout out drew um who if you if you're just tuning in to us, you might not you might not be aware of Drew, but he did the high brown fritillary uh, butterfly creature feature a few weeks ago. He was one of our co uh, our, our um weekly co hosts, but he decided to take a a uh, a step back from from uh, kind of in, in front, front of the camera and the microphone. Yeah, he still does do the artwork for us, and he did this wonderful um rosetted. Uh, le uh, leopard so this wonderful rosetted jaguar that you'll see behind us but then last minute i said to him oh would you mind drew please pretty please uh to do a melanistic version too and if you look carefully at his melanistic version he's mm. kind enough to actually um display exactly what i'm talking about with the 
the rosettes are actually true black. So when you look at it, you might not see it. But if you have a close look at, at our artwork this week, Drew has made sure that the uh, the coat, the base coat color and the rosette color uh, reflects this difference in in tone. It's always it's always nice when he's doing a like a day of um, going through and drawing all of the upcoming species um, because it's just this nice sort of continuous backwards and forwards between the three of us of mm. how we want the animal to look and yeah we get uh, to you know discuss it and you know, see the little bit behind the scenes. To be honest, I, I I would actually want Drew to work to do one of these as a with like a live stream or something. Live, yeah, that that'd be a good Which, idea. Uh, we could do it. Drew draws. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'll write that on the board that's yeah, behind the pitch, camera. Pitch now. that one to him later. He doesn't know yeah. it, but he's doing it. Um, <laughs> but and then we end up with this nice sort of continuous stream of uh, finished artwork coming in, which has mm. basically been today. We've had a a load of new species, but uh, you'll be. So I can't. I can't remember the name. It's Silo Silo uh, Cave. No no, 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 don't reveal anything now. Okay. Um. I, okay. I won't say any more. But yeah, we've had a steady stream of them. Uh, coming in. Yeah. Uh, do you know what? I, I, I screw it. I'm gonna double down on the genetic nerdery, and I am gonna tell you about the the difference between leopard melanism and uh and um and jaguar melanism because I'm not sure I can wait till next year when I finally get around to doing leopards but i i mentioned that jaguar melanism comes from a dominant gene um well leopards is the opposite it actually comes from a recessive gene did you know that gareth no i was completely unaware yeah. it's not honestly something i'd ever looked into i do you know what this makes me think back to just after we had uh professor andrew pask on um and i said that i i kind of wish i'd gotten into genetics and that kind of thing because whenever there's something genetics involved in the creature features, it really does perk my interest up. I really, really do enjoy it. Mm. But yeah, um, yeah, melanism, the two forms of melanism in these two big cats, um, jaguars is, is a dominant gene and leopards is a recessive gene. So, uh, so yeah, it's, um, yeah, cool. that means it's, it's harder to get melanistic leopards than it is to get melanistic jaguars. Hmm. Yeah. Um, now, what's really interesting uh, is that studies actually show that the mel melanistic form of um, of of jaguar is actually most active during a full moon night. Although I'm not sure why. There doesn't be a reason why. Why um, the what a, what a full moon would do um, gives you a bit more light, if anything. I yeah, it gives you extra this is the reason why wolves get excited by a full moon is because it's, it's not, they're not howling at the moon. They're just excited because uh, it's a hive of activity because they're going to be able to hunt through the night and play through the night. Mm. And I would imagine that the, having a dark coat, like a melanistic Jaguar uh, means that you can take advantage of that at night, but on a full moon night, not only do you get to take advantage of your, your, superior camouflage coat you also get to take advantage of your superior eyesight so that would be the conclusion i draw to that oh so um yeah but very very cool which whichever coat the cat has at whatever time of their daily activity range that they find themselves in the cat the jaguar just melts into the background um it's a silent invisible killer in the shadows um Obligate carnivores and large apex predators, as the jaguar is, uh, they typically have a pretty impressive uh, prey gallery. So they'll be hunting anything from like capybara, giant anteaters and their cousins, the tamandua, collared peccary, marsh deer, caimans, agoutis, turtles, fish, and unfortunately livestock too, which brings them into some trouble with farmers although a lot of farmers over there are very supportive of the jaguar and are just looking for ways where they can kind of remedy the livestock predation uh, all of these are considered favorable by jaguars looking for a meal um, they are of course an ambush predator so jaguars will creep up on potential uh, prey getting within pouncing distance and then watching from a vantage point 
The Jaguar will await for the opportune moment before exploding from their hiding spot uh, whilst their prey's back is turned, essentially. And their modus operandi is a little bit different to other big cats. So they don't go for the jugular so much. They tend to go for the cranium up here. Um, and basically, a, the the prey is dispatched via a very swift, strong bite to the to the skull, crushing the animal's head in the most powerful bite in the cat family. Uh, but that same bite, when it's applied to chelonians, like uh, freshwater turtles, so terrapins and, um, and, and such, it's used to crush the carapace of its victim. So this is a really powerful bite. In fact, that bite, as I say, strongest bite in the cat family, it exerts a crushing pressure of up to uh, 1,500 PSI. Uh, so you would not want to uh, be on the wrong side of that. Uh, well, no, they've got. Uh, there's enough power in that bite to um, to get through the osteoderms, the, the bone armor, and things like caiman and alligators. That's right. Which yeah. they'll routinely catch and kill. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Now the bite isn't the only impressive thing about the hunt. Uh, once they've applied that bite and they've dispatched their prey, they then take it to dense vegetation where they can gorge feed on it. Now that can include dragging it long distances off of a, a, a grassy a grassy um, clearing or indeed traversing through rivers and swamps. And these guys can pull surprisingly heavy carcasses, whether that be caiman or some sort of large mammalian, like a giant anteater or something, a capybara, mm. large capybara. And they can not just drag these long distances, but they can swim whilst carrying these things. Uh, and then climb up the sometimes quite steep riverbanks with them um, to to bring them to a, the ideal place, which is in some dense, lush vegetation where they can uh, hide it and gorge feed them um, in peace. Also, when there's uh, when there's when when the flood waters are, are high, uh, jaguars, although not quite as adept at it as tigers or or, or certainly leopards. Jaguars will actually climb straight up trees with their with their prey and they'll hide them up there, store them up there to gorge feed again in peace, making sure that flood waters aren't going to come and and wash their prey away. So, like I say, just a really impressive animal. Um, and you might have gathered from what I've just explained, like the tiger, jaguars are not bothered by water. In fact, they quite like it and uh, and they'll use it. Uh, both as a means to travel and as a means to hide. So um, I love the. Uh, cool. I can't remember where the picture's from, but it's. I'm I'm guessing from a zoo, of a jaguar that's jumping into water to try and catch a bit of enrichment with that ridiculous face. Yeah. Of, uh, I feel like out eyes just bug eyed. That's and... it. Yeah, I, I think that, like that perfectly something... demonstrates their their then happiness to be in water. I can't. I I I strongly feel like that's like San Diego Zoo or or yeah, possibly Bush Gardens or or something like that. I'm I'm pretty certain of that. Now, uh, kind of to finish up, I wanted to take some time because I've not done this with a few species for a little while, but I wanted to finish up on kind of the profound and far-reaching influence that an animal has had on on human. Um, culture and jaguars are are certainly one that has had that deep impact with us before columbus landed in the americas with his particular brand of evil uh the jaguar has been a symbol of power for many it had its own cult of worship in the 900s uh spread by the chavrin culture of modern day peru after these the mocha uh, peoples uh, held the jaguar in similar esteem, adorning many artifacts with the animal. Religions in the Andes dressed themselves in jaguar pelts, worshipping the animal as sacred, and these pelts were traded across peoples and cultures. One such religion, uh, now I struggle to say this one, I think it's Muisca. Muisca? Anyway, they had a ruler named uh, Nemekene. Uh, whose name derives from the local language and meant force of the jaguar. Um, also, kind of very, well, I mean, all of it's cool, but this is particularly cool. Where jaguars were a thing 
historically. Uh, they were represented oh, yeah. across the Yucatan Peninsula. So like werewolves, but were were jaguars. Oh, um, were ja- Oh, right. Actually, you say that. That's actually a thing that has come out of um, real world mythology into D D. So there are were jaguars and were tigers in D. I'd heard of were tigers uh, in D and D. I've never heard of it in um in terms of mythology. Uh closest things I can think of in mythology are, are werewolves, obviously. Um I mean I think that's ultimately more terrifying than a werewolf would be a yeah. were jaguar. Yeah. Um I think it would just leave a wolf in the dust. Yeah. Plus werewolves kind of lost a lot of the kind of freaky fear factor for me as I like quite early on in my in my career when I actually learned what wolves do and what they're like. Um yeah. as cool as wolves are, they are incredibly flighty animals and I don't yeah, I don't to think... be honest, the best interpretation of werewolves uh this is coming completely off the track is is very much from uh, what we do in the shadows so uh yeah that not, would be the best bit. having not seen what we do in the shadows yet i do intend to watch it but having not seen it my favorite that's your homework for the week my homework is to watch what we do in the shadows <laughs> yeah fair enough i might go and do that after we're done here <laughs> the um i holding my final opinion until after i've watched that my my favorite versions of werewolves have been it was probably the first two underworld movies and um what's it the british one dog soldiers dog soldiers very good brilliant yeah. film yeah um so yeah where jaguars sorry we'll get back on track guys a uh, where jaguar i want to see a where jaguar film that'd be good I think that would be cool. They were they were historically represented across the Yucatan Peninsula, um, and uh, and it lends itself to the next bit a little bit because Mayans actually had a warrior class uh, inspired by jaguars, Ooh. in much the same way that berserkers and Ulfhjona and uh, Jofa uh, represented um, Viking warrior classes based on bears, wolves, and boars, respectively. Um, so you'd have like the Vikings had berserkers and, and such, and the, the Mayans had um had Jaguar Jaguar warriors, which I think might have been mentioned in that film Apocalypto, which is an incredibly good odd film. Very, but, yeah. very underrated film. I I really enjoyed uh um Apocalypto. Um a Mel Gibson film, yeah. Yeah, Mel Gibson not so much but uh but the movie itself is if you can separate the art from the artist the art was was pretty good i thought yeah Um, yeah yeah. but yeah these these mayan jaguar warriors were the epitome of strength bravery and ferocity and their feline counterparts were seen as death totems associated with the underworld and adorning tombs and the and the items held within for the Aztecs, the jaguar was the king of the animals, balancing ferocity with wisdom, um, which is a particularly cool idea, very reminiscent of Athena, actually, goddess of war, um, because she, her, the whole point of her was she was the antithesis of of Ares. Ares was the god of war in a very much bloodlust kind of way, whereas uh, and wanting to fight, whereas Athena was i suppose you could call her war strategy the goddess of war strategy uh because she was a goddess of war but as i say goddess of wisdom and strategy too and that's kind of how jaguars were seen in uh by the aztecs and again the jag the jaguar warrior class was continued in the aztec civilization too um so yeah the species also features in the arts and artifacts of first nation peoples uh, native to the United States, including uh, the Anasazi, the Hopi, and the Pueblo peoples. In modern times, the Jaguar is also the herald of a car manufacturer, which is what Gar- Gareth was yeah. alluding to at the beginning of this creature feature. Uh, so the car has got the same name. It's Jaguar. and um, oh, Sorry, Jaguar in this case, I guess. It's a jag. Jag. And it has a um a leaping uh cat on it. 
Jag. However, if memory serves, and I'll have to look this up, uh, or perhaps Gareth, you could maybe look this up whilst I finish this uh, creature feature off. Mm. If memory serves, the the cat uh, on at the on the uh, on the jaguar, the 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 statue for the car, or whatever you call it, the metal yeah. figure on the front of the bonnet, it's actually modelled on a cheetah. Is it? I think so. Uh, Doesn't feel look free, like a cheetah, but feel fair free enough. To fact check me. Um, we'll fact check that one in 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 between. I think, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I believe it is uh, modelled on a cheetah. Um, the jaguar is also the national animal of Guyana. Um, it is also a uh, mischievous mascot for the Jacksonville Jaguars NFL franchise. A, a mascot called Jackson Deville. Um, who's gotten into some controversy over the years, it seems. Uh, and also, uh, you got to mention El Jaguar. Um, now he is a Hydra agent in Marvel Comics. Uh, so the list, of course, yeah. Uh, he he actually replied. Oh, I can't remember. Oh no, I'm failing. I'm failing my uh my fellow comic book nerds. He's actually he replaces someone. Who's a Hydra agent? Uh, in like an Elseworlds comic. So, in in uh, on Earth six one six, there's a certain agent of Hydra, and then on another Earth in the multiverse, it's El Jaguar, and I can't remember. I can't remember who he replaces. Oh, that's gonna that is gonna annoy me. I'm gonna have to fact check that one too. Um, but I I I could go on and on. The list certainly does go on and on for for how this beautiful and impressive and awe-inspiring cat has uh, has influenced and inspired our cultures uh, for, for millennia. Um, but I feel like that's a good moment to wrap this creature feature up. I, I was going to add one just briefly, actually. Yeah? Um, good. That, uh, well, the, any, any of the rugby uh, supporting uh, people will be aware of, there is a team that has a Jaguar for their logo. Really? Can you name it, Aaron? No. I really? don't. Well, firstly, I don't know anything about rugby. And secondly, it's very odd for, uh, for a, uh, a, a British uh, thing to have anything American about it. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's a team that often goes by the name Los Pumas. So uh, that already... Um, Hmm. That already confuses it, but on the logo, it is very much a jaguar. I gave you the uh, uh, the colours of their their logo. Uh, sorry, their team colours. Would that help? Blue and white striped. No, that doesn't. That doesn't help at all for me. Oh dear, it's Argentina. Oh, is it? Oh, right. Fair yeah. enough. Argentina, right, that, and then that's an American. The... That's that's it within their range. So yes, I was. I was trying to think of English uh, or British rugby teams that had that had a jaguar. Well, I mean, we've got all sorts of like domestic teams that have got odd names, but um, no international teams. The Argentina team, their logo is a jaguar, even though they themselves are called the Pumas, which has always sat really irritating with me because it's not a puma; it's a flipping jaguar. Or if it is a if it is a puma, it's a baby puma because it's got spots. But anyway, back to you. Before I lose my voice, well, that that's the end of the creature feature. So uh... let's move on into our emails then. Let's do it. <laughs> Bing, you've got mail. Ooh, it's an email. Right. Well, we're into this week's email, so I'm going to try and do this with as much energy as I can possibly muster. Um, but we're going to start off with last week's question, which was, uh, what is the largest invertebrate you have ever seen? Photos welcome. Unfortunately, we didn't get any photos, which is a shame. So open to get some uh, truly giant bugs. Spencer seems to start things off. Uh, the first and only time I went spelunking, which is uh, going into a cave um, and or, you know, sort of hole in the ground. Uh, there was a wolf spider, I think. The size of my head within a foot of my face. I waited outside for everyone after that. To be fair, if you had a, a very large spider right next to your face, it's enough to scare you. Although the thing that would probably terrify me is is being in a cave underground. That's more not my thing. Yeah, I got the next one. Uh, um, and that comes to us from Phil Barber, who says, if preserved, 
Uh, count. Oh, if preserved, count then the giant squid at Natural History Museum. To which Steve Trim has answered, "That's awesome." Yeah, that is that is pretty cool. Um, I'd I'd say that counts. I mean, it's yeah, I would say so. Going to be easier than trying to see it in the wild. I think less dangerous. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, uh, my other half has put uh, the large yet easily identifiable cockroach in the order Blatoididae, usually found in large numbers, especially around 10 Downing Street. They're the most at home amongst the waste produced by the human race. They can uh, range in appearance from stick-like to bounceable. They are rarely truly monogamous, usually have some hidden malts in their wardrobe, and are amongst the few species on Earth who will intentionally stab their own species in the back for a profit. That's right, I'm talking about politicians, uh, mostly conservatives. But uh, yes, so um, not actually an invertebrate, I suppose, but uh, funny political satire there from my other half. Yeah. <laughs> Although I don't think it's fair to lump, uh, you know, cockroaches in with uh, with uh, politicians. Cockroaches are clean, important animals that, you know, help the planet. Anyway, so moving swiftly on from uh, from giant invertebrates, this week's question, well, we're going to do a poll again, actually, because uh, I think the elephant one worked so well last time at partially enraging you, Aaron, I think. Uh, well, not enraging me, just because because I can understand. I can understand why people like the different elephants for different reasons. It's it just a bit weird that the forest elephant did as well as it did that was suspect i felt i feel well we'll see how you feel with this week's one uh we're basically going to say which is your favorite of the five big cats so you have five choices uh in descending size order you've got tiger lion jaguar leopard snow leopard um basically pick your one and and we will see who comes out on top erin Probably no surprise as to what your one would be, I'd say. I guess. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, for me, I'm uh, I'm torn between snow leopards, and I'd also t- say tigers as well. But I think I'd probably go snow leopards just to be just to be edgy. Oh, I do like snow leopards. That's a good choice. Yeah, not yeah. really a bad choice in this poll. No, I don't think there's any any of those that are not uh, a good cat species. Anyway, that aside, this week's question is a poll. Let us know which is your favorite big cat species by uh, doing that on our Facebook page um, and letting us know. Just basically, yeah, pick your favorite cat. And that's just one of the many ways that you can get in contact with us uh, is through our Facebook page where we have things going up daily. Uh, But you can also get in contact with us via our email address, which is the nathistorycupboard at gmail.com. Or you can get in contact with us like these fantastic people have, via our Patreon. Aaron, tell us about our Patreon whilst I die a little in the corner here. <laughs> uh, that's right, Gareth. Well, hopefully you don't, don't, uh, you don't expire uh, whilst I read this out. Uh, but every week we like to give a little love back by shouting out the names of our wonderful Patreon supporters. Now, these are the cupboard dwellers who have supported us uh, kindly through a monetary contribution for which we are grateful beyond words. And those people are, of course, Bogtober, Jen Greenhall, Connie P, Chelsea McKee, Nick to Nick, and Justin Knife. Uh, guys, your financial contributions are actively helping us here in the Natural History Cupboard in a myriad of ways, um, which I, I usually rattle off, but uh, there's, I don't think there's any need to. You guys know by now what what uh, what's what's going on and uh, and such. Uh, but we really can't thank you enough for for that help now we appreciate all of our cupboard dwellers and the support that you show us through listening liking sharing watching subscribing but if you feel we've earned it and you're thinking of joining our patreon uh there are two options through which you can do so and these are the nature nerds and the animal ambassadors and more details on those at a later date i think uh and, and once again Thank you so much for your continued support. It really does mean the world to us. Yeah, it does. And a big thank you to all of our Patreons. Um, but you can get involved in a variety of other ways. Money isn't everything. Um, you can like, subscribe, uh, leave a comment, tell a friend. All of those sort of things 
really help us out when it comes to being noticed in the algorithms and the wide worlds and the and the matrix i don't know um but uh yeah all of those things help out massively um so tell a friend tell an enemy tell a jaguar as it leaps out of a tree onto a caiman it it may be interested you never know uh but apart from that i think that pretty much brings us to the end of this week's episode so uh aaron thank you for 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 dialing me in from inside of the uh, the cupboard there it's it's been uh it's been a bit weird doing this uh uh remote again to be honest it's like with you. being interviewed by your own show it's weird it it's like being interviewed but it's also it it i do feel it cuts the fluidity but we had to do it this week uh for health reasons so it is i don't want to get him sick he don't want to get me sick you know no. I do have to say though, I I could uh I can like lean this way and put my feet up on the other yeah, side. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah. Why you're not like splayed pod- out? You know, just sort of ah. Oh. Yeah, do, do the podcast in a very relaxed manner. Just so say, "Sup, guys, welcome to the uh, natural history yeah. cover." Either that, <laughs> we, or what we have to start. Approach. Either either that, or what we have to start start doing is having a body double version of me that sits there. And then we superimpose my face on the body double. We could get a cardboard cutout like yeah, like like the uh like the fish that we have. Yep, get a life-sized Gareth cardboard cutout, have it placed next to you, and then you can superimpose my face on it. There you go. Right. Well, a big thank you to you, Aaron, uh, and a big thank you to you at home for listening and dealing with our insanity, I suppose. Um, and we'll see you next time here in the Natural History Cupboard. Bye. Bye. One does not simply have a jag. A jag. A jag. <laughs>